Welcome to System Mastery, the podcast where we get together and beat a dead horse 1d6 damage at a time. I'm Jeff, and as always, my co-host John is here with me. This week, we're diving into Legacy, War of Ages, a role-playing game that is... Well, I'm going to go right ahead and say it. It is a blowjob for a tiny dick. (laughs) We'll see you in a second. No, but seriously, we had a, we had a real intro re- like set to record there. It's just that John was doing some kind of pantomime with his mouth. Look, and- I was making the <laughs> I'm going to make myself throw up motion, not the I'm sucking a tiny dick motion. There's a difference. There is a difference, and I can tell. Like, the problem was it just looked like you were really bad at sucking a tiny dick. Like, <laughs> that, that was my initial thought. Not Too oh, much air. <laughs> too much air, not enough sucking. There's a, there's, <laughs> there's a ratio. <laughs> The golden ratio, as it's known. <laughs> yeah, the golden ratio of the dick suck. <laughs> ancient Romans knew. No, oh, ancient... boy, did they know. No, they had it all wrong. They had way too much teeth in their equation. <laughs> but they did invent the tiny dick thing, because the Romans they, were like... They invented the tiny dick. They, well, the, the tiny dick ratio, because the Romans were all about little boys and were gross. Yeah, I mean, so just, gross. Just gross. Every time people are like, let's... Let's idolize the Romans. And I'm like, you know those guys like ate beaks and raped kids, right? Like, they're just... That's just the worst society. They're just the... It's a good thing that they all died off of probably lead poisoning. (laughs) Yeah, someone went back in time and shot them all. (laughs) Yeah, lead poisoning from this pipe. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I want to start laying pipe. Well, wait a minute. (laughs) Or will you just make yourself barf? Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Or all of the above. It depends on what they're into. You don't know. Oh my god. Alright, so so this episode we're reviewing Legacy, War of Ages, a book written by a couple of folks named Blackmore. Do you think they're really named Blackmore? I mean, it's not impossible. Do you think it's like Kilgrave, right? Like, they're they're not really named Kilgrave. No one's named that. (laughs) You know, they could be Blackmore. Maybe it's one of those things where they're like, well, my last name is Blackmore. I've got to start writing shitty RPGs now. I, I feel like that's the case for a couple of RPG writers. I, I'd say Greenwood. Like, if your name is Ed Greenwood, then you're going to drop that Ed right away, and you're going to be like, I'm writing about fairies in the woods. I'm Ed Greenwood. Except he was like, I'm going to keep the Ed so girls know I'm going to grab their boobs if they get near me. <laughs> that's Remember that, anyone out there listening that's named Ed? <laughs> that's what it conveys. Well, no, because Ed Greenwood's famously kind of a creepy old man archetype. So, I just, I feel like he was like, it's not like Diamond Joe Biden, you know? He's got that kind of persona of, like, if you get anywhere near me, I'm gonna touch you. Ew. Ew. <laughs> hey, lady, I got a surprise for you. It's in my beard. <laughs> oh, ew. And then Gygax, of course. I mean, it's amazing to me that his last name has never been made into a D&D monster. It should be. Maybe, right? Maybe it was, but then he sprung a wholesale from the pages. Yeah. It was like the Tarask sm- thus smite the mighty Gygax and laid it low upon the uh, tarmac. I have to imagine there are at least a handful of heartbreakers out there that were like, and here's our monster section. This is the mighty Gygax, eh? Yeah, right? Because eh? it's, it's such a, la- a, a, a monster name from d Oh, yeah. It fits right in with all your flumps and ank <laughs> Yeah. And golden gorgers. Abeleths. Man, Golden Gorger just sounds like someone that fights the Flash. Oh, yeah, it totally does, doesn't it? Well, the Golden Glider's right in there, but the Golden Gorger also sounds like a great Flash villain. It's like, oh, I can eat whatever. Oh, you're just mad at lad. Get out of here. Oh, get out. <laughs> Go to a worse comic. <laughs> Don't try and change your terrible name to an even more terrible name. <laughs> Actually, I feel like Golden Gorger would be a good nickname for Jabba the Hutt. Uh, the, great, uh, the great Golden Gorger. Most excellent Jabba of Hutts. I could see that. I yeah. could see possibly that. Yeah, that's, that'd be fine, too. Yeah. As long as it's not just Matter Eater Lad trying to sneak in there. Man, that is just the worst, because that's... It's just what your power is. It'd be like if Cyclops' name was Shoot Eye Beams from Face Guy. <laughs> Which it might as well have been, right? <laughs> are there any of those? Are there any X-Men whose names are just a little too on the nose? Uh, Beak? Okay, Beak. I would say Magic, because her power is having some magic. 
Except it's so ill-defined. It's like Scarlet Witch which is like, what's your thing? Oh, I'm a mutant that can affect probabilities. Also, I'm a wizard. You're like, wait, what? Oh, you know what? All of the mutants who can affect probabilities have dumb on the nose names. Because you got your long shot. Okay, yeah, that's pretty obvious. You got your, who's the other one? Uh, Domino. Domino. See right there, another probability thing. And Black Cat. There you go. Yeah, Black Cat, another luck thing. So they're See, all but that's, on the nose. that's not so much on the nose as it is like, oh, okay, that has to do with a luck-based thing. Yeah, also all the Spider-Man villains. Like, all of them. Scorpion? He's kind of like a scorpion. Vulture? Eh, he's kind of like a vulture, I guess. Just don't even worry about it. Well, you know... Spider-Man. Well, you couldn't... Yeah, Spider-Man. You couldn't call all of... Normally, the way you do that to get around it is to just put the color that they are in front of their name. But it wouldn't work with Spider-Man because, like, all of his villains are green. See, but that's that's saying what they are, but not what their powers are. It'd be like, oh, yeah, Vulture's name is Flies Flies Around Guy. So so Stiltman. Stiltman would be the ultimate example. Okay, there you go. But even then, it would be Walks on Stiltman. (laughs) Walks on Stiltman. (laughs) <laughs> Matter Eater Lad is garbage well, and should feel bad about well, it's himself. It's the Legion of Superheroes, though. That's the way it is with those idiots. Every one of them is just, put your power down, add Lad or Lass as necessary. Well, I mean, you got some that are like, you know, Santa, Saturn Boy or some bullshit yeah, like that. All the powers of Saturn. Yeah, no. Of a, no, like a mid-market SUV. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Lincoln Man with all the powers of a Lincoln. I can disgorge a Matthew McConaughey to, to hype for me. <laughs> <laughs> but you got like Bouncing Boy I mean his power is Bouncing <laughs> Stone Boy With all the powers Of some stone I'm getting stoned Yeah and then Triplicate Girl Who can split into Three girls Oh man Triplicate Is amazing That's the different name That's some new name They came up with for Originally it was Triplicate Lass Oh because yeah Because they were like You can't not call her Lass Well that was the whole Point of them Is they were like You know what we love We love the golden age of superheroes where everyone was something man or whatever woman, so we're going to be that. It's funny how they keep breaking away from that, and you can always tell because that every character that's even more edgy or is derived from someone evil is like, no, fuck that. So you got like Lone Wolf and Brainiac 5, and then whatever they call the Superman of the far future. like Superboy? Yeah, well, that's just Superboy, I guess. But yeah. Anyway, we should really talk about Legacy, War of Ages. (laughs) Okay, so... This book is Highlander. Yeah. This Review is... done. Let's get back to comic books. <laughs> comic books. <laughs> okay, so Legacy War of Ages is the most bald-faced ripoff of more than one property I've ever seen. Yeah, well, it's a unlicensed Highlander game. And I don't mean that, like, oh, it's got some things in common. I mean, it is literally copy and paste Highlander into then other people's stuff. Yeah, so what they did was they took Highlander, they took the word Highlander out of it, and turned it into Immortal. And turned it into Immortal. Then they decided to push it forward by a couple hundred, or like a hundred years, to set it in like 2105, which makes it perfect, which is perfect, because then they decided to set it in the world of William Gibson's Neuromancer, <laughs> which is really obvious. And it has nothing to do with them. It's like they decided they really liked Highlander, they really liked Neuromancer, wanted to make a game with both, but then neither part touches the other one. Yeah, because your immortal character is immune to all the cyber nonsense, because he's an immortal and he doesn't understand all your fancy technology because he's from the 1500s, but he's walking around in the 2100s going like, what are these computers? I can't have a cybernetic implant, but here's a whole bunch of sections of pa- of information on what how, what they do and how they work. Oh yeah, well it's, you put a setting of the immortals in a place and time where it's like, oh yeah, this is cyberpunk and everyone's jacking in, and they're like... Oh, I can't have that. Because I'm an immortal, my body would immediately reject any sort of cybernetic implant. So I can't get on your Winternet. My primary... Winternet? Motherfucker. The the internet in this game is called the Winternet. It's set in the 2100s. The Winternet is described as a rogue AI that is trying to avoid the other rogue AI that's a part of it. And if they ever come together, they'll become the true AI and, like, conquer the world or something. That is Wintermute and Neuromancer, the two rogue AIs, from the book Neuromancer. They changed Winter Mute to Winter Net, and we're like, fine, we won't get sued. Let's move along. Oh, yeah. Well, the fact that even in the book, like, there's some sidebar where everything is a uh, its own little section, and everything starts with a quote. Everything. Oh, my God. Of course Literally they... everything. Oh, yeah, and the quote's ridiculous. Well, it's it'll go from, like, here's a quote from Aristotle to here's a quote from the Smiths. Yeah. And like, <laughs> okay, great. You can, you can really get a sense of the kind of bands that the authors of this liked in, like, 1988. Oh, yeah. Well, you're like, oh, well, here's a quote from Dante's Inferno followed by a quote from Susie and the Banshees. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Presence abilities. 
I exploit you, still you love me. I tell you one and one makes three. I'm the cult of personality. From the- Living Colors, Cult, cult of, of Personality. Yeah, and I just opened the book at random. These guys really like Living Color. There's one quote in here from the fucking Bangles. I mean, it's just silly. Well, the- <laughs> so the reason I even brought that up is... One of the little side sections that they talk about is called Blood of Kings. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, so now not only are you ripping off Highlander, you're ripping off the Highlander song that Queen did. Yeah. And I'd say the best ripoff, which we might as well get to as long as we're still on the ripoff category, is that this game has psychic powers. It certainly does. Which, I don't know if Highlander movies ever had psychic powers. Uh, well, the main one that they have in there is the one that you got from Highlander, which is... You can tell when other yeah, immortals are nearby. The foreboding, they call it in here. Yeah. Yeah, you can sense other... So there's basic... Your basic collection of psychics, your your prescience, and so on. One of them is described as being a mix of all the other ones, and is the most powerful, but also the weakest, is the way they describe it. And it opens with a quote from an Ursula K. Le Guin novel called The Left Hand of Darkness. And the power is called Farfetching. And it's very nebulous, and it doesn't really have a good description of how it, how it works or what it does. And that is because Farfetching is a power from the Ursula K. Le Guin novel, The Left Hand of Darkness. They didn't even file the serial numbers off here. They were just like, you know what I like? A power in an Ursula K. Le Guin novel. Let's just steal it, not change the name, put it in there, and then to make sure everyone knows we stole it, we'll put a quote from the novel we stole it from above it. Yay! <laughs> and, okay, so this happens... Throughout the book. The whole book is just, all right, well, we like this book, so we put that in there. We like this movie, so we put that in there. And that's just the whole thing. It's just that. But it gets to the end. The very end of the book, after reading everything, the uh, afterthought at the end of it is, oh, and by the way, you may think that some of these things are familiar, but hey, who knows? Like... The ideas come from wherever. And you're like, no, you stole this. From very obvious things is where you I, stole this. Was from. this book written by Shia LaBeouf? <laughs> I, I mean, actual cannibal Shia LaBeouf? I, yeah. <laughs> He's standing behind you, Shia LaBeouf. <laughs> <laughs> Running for your life for Shia LaBeouf. Kung Fu fighting Shia LaBeouf. <laughs> uh, no, uh... The, the, cause now we're stealing from <laughs> whoever did that. But no, that, that afterward at the end where they're like... Every idea isn't original, you guys. You can't blame us for stealing every single thing in this book from somewhere because those people didn't have original ideas. Yeah, great. Yeah, okay, but if those people were better at having unoriginal ideas than you were, I don't watch Highlander and think, man, these guys sure did rip off the following two movies. <laughs> That's the problem, is when you, you've you made it so obvious of what you've ripped off, like, you can have a thing where you go, all right, we have a game set around people that are immortal. Okay, you might say, oh, that kind of sounds like a Highlander thing, but if you then left out the whole part where it's like, oh, but they're all trying to cut each other's heads off, and there can be only one, and so on and so on, you go, oh, it's just Immortals, it's not Highlander Immortals. But no, it's, you're Immortal, you can be born whenever as an Immortal, you only die if someone cuts your head off, and if they do, they get... The Rapture, not the Quickening, The Rapture. The Rapture being a bunch of lightning that suddenly shows up, and then that person gets some of your power. Yep. It is just... They copy... Like I said, they copy and pasted Highlander, and then did a find and search for Highlander, replaced it with Immortal, find and search Quickening, replaced with Rapture. Yeah, and then find and search Scottish, replaced with Furry Pirate. (laughs) But no, actually, because when you go through the character creation (laughs) section in this book, one of the guys really wants to play a mentor... And his plan is to play a 15th century Spanish sword master who wants to train the other two immortals, but he speaks with a slightly British or Scottish accent, maybe. Uh, Get fucked. At least change the nationalities away from Sean Connery. I and mean, his, my character's name is Connor Connery? Con Connery. <laughs> my character's name is James Bond Zardoz. <laughs> Oh, Zardoz Bond. Zardoz Bond the Rock. (laughs) And the Little People. Zardoz Bond the Rock and the Little People. Quartermain. (laughs) God damn you, book. It's just ridiculous. I'm surprised the other character's name wasn't like Lambert Christopher. (laughs) Christopher. Christopher. All right, we should really maybe mention the rules of this stupid piece of garbage. No. Okay. 
So, once you get through some real head up its own ass writing at the beginning. Oh my god, it's so bad. It's you know that you know, every, we always talk about this how every book thinks it's the first RPG you've ever read. And that's, you know, that's a good business model to go, okay, I have to assume that maybe someone picked up this book with its boring picture of a sword on the cover and was like, "Oh, this is an RPG? I've never heard of these, but I'm willing to learn." And then they open it up and it's like four pages of like, "Oh, you'll need mood lighting." And you'll definitely want to have some swords around, but no one should carry a sword. That could get dangerous. Now, it's often easy to lose yourself in the character, because you are the character, but the character is not you. You need to find a good balance in this world of imagination that you have created. I'm like, okay, okay, great, thank you. A good snack for gaming is evocative, but not unusually sugary. Consider a nut blend, perhaps, or a roasted pork. I mean, it's it just goes so deep. And then all this stuff about mood music being like, oh, you might wish to consider more gothic music, or perhaps something from the electronic variety. Because, oh god, I'll, I'll mention that. The world that they live in is the techno-gothic world of uh, fucking Legacy. And it is capitalized techno-gothic. That is the world name. And every time it says techno-gothic, I want to punch the text. Now, do you think that that's perhaps because they were trying to set up, like, a universe that this was part of? Like, a shared storyline? And they are, actually. Yeah. So, one of the things they mention are warlocks. Mm -hmm. And then in the very back of the book is an ad for our upcoming book, Warlock. Now, what do you what rip movie do you think that's a rip-off of? Do, uh, do you think it's just Warlock? Is that a movie? Yeah, it is a movie, but it's a, it's a horror one. It... Feels much more like they're ripping off uh, Mage from World of Darkness. Oh, I can see that. Because the whole point is, what is this? Oh, they fight weird things that humanity doesn't know about, and they have reality-shaping powers. What's the series of movies that stars Angus Grimm? Sorry, I mean Scrim. Angus Scrim. Yes, of course. Angus, Angus Scrim. Yeah. You remember him? Yeah, I remember him. From the Google search, you just paused the podcast to go do... Oh, you son of a bitch. <laughs> there is no magic here. <laughs> Peek behind the curtain, sheeple. <laughs> Try and take this a little seriously. We got a Patreon donation this morning. See the wizard for what he is. <laughs> a man with a Google <laughs> search bar. <laughs> Fuck, I, okay, I thought Warlock might be a ripoff of Phantasm. Okay, uh, no, I think, because Warlock really, really sounds like it's uh, the mage. old World of Darkness mage. Because the whole point is, they ha their powers are just, I changed reality. Okay, sure enough. So they're just like, okay, once we're finished making this immortal book, we'll just go rip off all of World of Darkness. Oh, yeah, I have to imagine that that was like... Because they already have in this book shapeshifters and vampires. Oh, yeah. And uh, the warlocks as their three main antagonists, which means you have vampires, werewolves, and mages as your three antagonists. Wait, wait, uh, you said shapeshifters. Does that mean you also have changelings? Uh, no. Changelings are the Dwimmer Lake... Oh, god damn it! Why did I even ask? I don't care about Old World of Darkness at fucking all. Go ahead, keep talking. What the fuck is a Dwimmer Lake? Okay, so the, the main three or four antagonists they have in this book are the Nosferatu, right. which are just vampires. Sure, sure. Very inventive name, by the way. Oh, yeah, totally inventive. You'd think that they'd want to give them a techno-gothic name, and I, yes, I am pronouncing the capital letters. Uh, <laughs> like, you know, they, they have to call them, like, Cyber Vamps. Oh, yeah, you'd think, they, you'd think that, but no, they're not inventive enough for that. Blood when, downloaders. When you're really busy trying to rip off everything else, you don't have time to give it an inventive name. You're just like, who else has ripped off vampires? Can I rip off someone else who ripped off vampires and gave them a rip-off name? What? You say that someone did that in the 20s and they just changed Dracula to Nosferatu? Done. Good enough. I can steal from thieves. I'm Shia LaBeouf the book. Moving on. <laughs> uh, the shape changers are Chimera. Okay, once again. And the Chimera can change into anything that they have eaten. Oh, good. So we're not just ripping off uh, Werewolf, but we're also ripping off Exalted's Lunars. Yes. Okay. Uh, the uh, Warlocks, like we have mentioned, are just mages. They okay. just have reality-shaping powers. Okay. And the Dwimmer Lake are weird, basically chthonic monstrosities. Ugh, chthonic. But all of them have different powers, and they all look different, and no two are the same. But the only thing they have alike are they can change reality. Okay, great. So sure. they're they are basically Fey. So they're all just Colossus's older brother. <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> it's a, correct. It's a whole species of uh, what Rasputin. Is Rasputin. There yeah. you go. What's his real name? It's something. 
Oh, I don't even give a shit. Whatever. I'm cutting this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. There, there's a bunch of monsters that are obviously just the World of Darkness monsters, but why would you care as an immortal? Because your, your whole time is going to be spent fighting the Kurgan. Well, yeah. The I mean, the problem is they give you like, oh, they're vampires and weird things and whatnot. But as an immortal, mostly you don't care. Yeah, like, why would okay. you? You can't get turned into them. No. You are immune to all of these, and the only ones who might want to actually do something to you are maybe the Chimera if they want to eat you. Sure. How many of the Highlander movies have you actually seen? One. Just the first one? No, the last one. Okay, because I've seen the first t- uh, three. And and mostly I wanted to see two just because I've heard it's famously bad, and it is. It goes to like other <laughs> it goes to other planets and stuff, and it's so weird, and it's always just been kind of cut out of the canon. Um and then the third one I had to see because I if I remember correctly, that's the one with like Mario Van Peebles as the villain. <laughs> uh I'll I don't know which one it was, but all I saw was the one that had the guy from the TV show in the movie. Okay, I've not seen that. I've seen like the first three. So the thing I, I, I the reason I bring that up is because there's no sense when you're watching the movies that the immortals or the Highlanders are like superheroes that also kill each other sometimes. It's like all they do is kill each other. Like some of them try not to get involved in the whole thing of killing each other, and then they spend all their time just trying to pretend that they're humans. But they're never like, "Yes, I will right wrongs until someone cuts off my head." It's always just, "Fuck off! I'm Christopher Lambert, and I want to live quietly in a garage." Yeah, which the before it gets to the section of how to run a game, it says that it it says, "Oh yeah, uh, most of the time there are a bunch of formalities and weird." niceties you have to do as an immortal if you meet someone else. But mostly it's either you're going to go around trying to kill as many people as possible and gain all their power, or you're going to hide from the people who are doing that. Right, which is like, okay, so first thing you should do if you're an immortal and your ti- your entire existence is based around cutting off the heads of other immortals or not getting your head cut off by other immortals is form into an organized party and go help humans. Yeah, I... Okay, I can understand if you have maybe two immortals who are like, oh yeah, we're going to watch each other's back. We won't kill each other until it comes to the final conflict where all of the last immortals show up and try and kill each other so there can only be one. Right. Uh, You might say, okay, that might happen. Uh, Or maybe you would have like one or two and then some mortals helping you. And the thing is... Being immortal isn't quite the worst thing ever in this setting because the rules for, like, how you can use weapons, if you can get a neural interface and get that on your gun, you will murder the fuck out of oh, every Oh, yeah, that immortal. was ridiculous. Yeah, it was so good. Anyway, we really, we have yet to discuss a rule in okay, this book. So let's, let's, get, let's go through the stat construction and so on. So you make a character, you have... Five four. stats, four that you have to pick from to start with, oh, and then yeah. one just starts at two. Yeah, one's a derived. Yeah, okay. Well, you got uh, your strength and agility, mm-hmm. your presence, and your psyche. presence, intelligence, and psyche. Okay, there you go. And psyche is the one that you don't get to pick. You pick one as your main, one as your secondary, and you can't pick psyche as your main or secondary unless your GM really wants you to. Right, because it's it, it, all it does is inform your psychic powers. Yeah, so it's your psychic powers, your psychic defense, all that is mm-hmm. your psyche, and a couple other little weird things in the system, but mostly that's it. Yeah. Uh, so unless you go up to your guy and you're like, Hey, GM, my concept for a character is fucking Firestarter the Immortal. Can I have a main psyche? Okay, sure. Otherwise, you have to pick from one of the other ones. And the, uh, what you do is, this is the quick character creation, by the way. Yeah, there are two types. Yeah, you pick, in quick character creation, you pick a primary, that gets a five. You pick a secondary, that gets a three in the stat. Everything else gets a two in the stat. Yes. Okay, great. Which automatically sets your psychic reserve, which is your amount of karma points or whatever you can spend to activate abilities and so on, to 20 because it's your psyche times 10. Well, don't call them karma points because that's your XP. Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. It's just your psychic reserve or your mana, if you will. Yeah. So you have uh, that stat, whatever it happens to be, is a 5, 3, and then 2's in the rest. Then 
in addition to that, you then pick skills based on, uh, the skill categories are strength agility is one category, and then presence is a category, and intelligence is a category, and then psyche is a category, although the skills under psyche are just psychic powers. They're all psychic powers. And the way this works is there's a big stack of strength and agility sp- skills, a big stack of intelligence skills. There are 13 each. 13 each. When you do quick start, you choose four from your primary statistic, and you get those at rank three. You get two from your your secondary statistic, and you get those at rank two. And then you choose five more from uh, anywhere at rank one. Yeah. So you start out with a fairly decent spread, whatever you're really good at. Uh, Stat-wise, you're going to be better at skills based on that to begin with. Uh, And that's a real quick character creation if you want to do that. If you want to do a uh, more in-depth, customized, I want to have everything under my control, then you can jump to this section with a quote from Samuel Johnson. Of course. The joy of life is variety. Yay! Variety Magazine is the joy of life magazine. (laughs) The joy of life cereal is Variety Magazine. (laughs) So, in that, you get, uh, a, like, all your stats start at one, and then you buy them up. And then you spend, basically, XP. Uh, the XP calculation for how to buy up your stats and abilities is the same as your starting spread. Mm-hmm. But they make it so that you've got uh, X amount of XP for stats and Y for abilities. You have to spend it on those. Yeah, a, a regular character gets 160 points to spend on statistics. And the statistics cost whatever they are times 10 to purchase. So, like, if you want to purchase a, a level 1 in a statistic, it's, it's 10 well, points. Well, you start at level 1. If you want to go yeah. to level 2, it's 10. It's 10. And then and then uh, for level 2, it's it's 30, I think. It's it's, it, w- it's 10 times your current. So, yeah, to go to level 3, it's 20, and right. so on. Okay, very good. And then abilities work the same way, but you start with less points. You end up with 50. And the reason I say that's to start a basic immortal is because you can also, also purchase, like, really, really old immortals. You'd be like, oh, my character's from fucking ancient Egypt, and so he has 360 points to spend on uh, attributes and so on. Although, you have to get your DM to agree with that, which he does in the in the game's con- construction model, when he's like, oh, we have three players, and here are their characters, and two of them are brand new, and they were born in the 1800s, and then one of them's from the 1200s, and he has more points. Don't worry about it. Yeah, the idea that whoever's running your game would go, yeah, I'll just let someone be twice as powerful as anyone else in there. That's cool. That sounds right. Yeah, makes sense to me. <sighs> but the the idea with that being, if you wanted to play a game where, I mean, obviously I'd say let all of your players be from whatever era it is, because it breaks down to like, these are the industrial era ones, or these are the era of faith, and that's like the Middle Ages, or this is from the age of myth, where it's like fucking your Gilgamesh and shit. Right. Oh, yeah. Gilgamesh, by the way, like the first immortal in this book. Yeah, well, it's the first recorded immortal. Yeah. Okay, so basically what you end up with is a character with a statistic or or statistics for, like, attributes that are ranged from 1 to 5, and then skills that range from 1 to 3. Yep. And then, guess what? You add those together and then roll under a number to see if you succeed at something. It's a very simple system. Yeah, so you take your stat plus ability... And then you're rolling D10s. It's a full D10-based game. Mm-hmm. And you need to roll under whatever that is. Right. So if you're really good at something because you start at stat 5 and ability 3, that's your best thing you can do, then you're rolling under it for an 8. You have yeah, to yeah. roll under an 8. Yeah, an 8 or under. Uh, which is which is not, not bad. The thing is, this game's pretty heavy on the penalties. Like, it really hits you hard with the penalties. The, the, the basic penalty is like, oh, you're trying to shoot that guy? It's windy, so take a minus five on your target number. <laughs> well, no, not that bad, but still. Yeah, th- that's the description that comes up a lot. A lot of the examples are, this guy tries to shoot this other guy, but the deck of the ship is moving, so he's at minus five. He will hit on a two or less. Yeah, the, the book's descriptions are real bad of saying like, oh yeah, this happens, and minus five. Minus five is supposed to be like, Oh, it would be impossible to do whatever you're trying to do. Yeah, but it comes up every time they're like, here's how you should do this, is apply this big-ass penalty so no one ever succeeds at anything. Except you go to the chart and it's like, oh, what happens? Oh, if someone's moving and trying to shoot, minus one. But then it goes to the description of it and you go, minus five. Yeah. Well, the end, the end result is that the way it looks when you're reading through is, oh, everything's impossible. This is a game that, which makes sense, because every weapon does a ridiculous, stupid amount of damage. But even then, so... Let's say 
no penalties. You're doing this under normal conditions, not ideal, so you're not getting a bonus, but no penalties. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're an average human who's actually fairly competent at something. Average human stat is a 2, and being fairly competent at something is a 2, which means you are failing more than half of the time if you are an average human that is competent. Right, so even though there is a defense system in place, you're still going to miss half the time anyway if you're playing an average character, which means you never hit. Oh, well, it means every character would go, all right, well, I put my five in my agility, Mm -hmm. and I put one of my agility strength things in using a sword, and I put that at three so that I can be at eight, because otherwise I will accomplish nothing. Yeah, no, it's ridiculous. Which is good, because the weapons all do insane damage anyway. Well, the Especially swords... The guns. Well, yeah, I'm like, the swords do some damage. You can defend against that. But then you look at the gun section, and this... The book breaks things down into two different types. It's bashing and lethal. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Casual, casual and severe. Casual and severe. And it's really weird the way it's written. Like, you can't have more casual damage than you currently have severe damage. Yeah, whatever your severe... You have a 1 to 10 rating in both casual and severe. If you take 10 points of casual damage, you're knocked unconscious. However, severe damage, if I had, say, 4 points of severe damage dealt to me because someone stabbed me with a sword, that also gives me 4 points of casual damage. Which means if then someone punched me for 6 points of casual damage, I would fall unconscious, even though before that I had taken no casual damage. Yeah. So it's just a track-like the health track, it just says, essentially, great, whatever you do, you have ten health levels. Yeah, it's just that sometimes you might get knocked unconscious instead of killed. No, it is it is literally the exact same as Bashing and Lethal from World of Darkness. It's just they have you track Bashing and Lethal separately when you shouldn't. Right. Well, I mean, if you think about it, you shouldn't do it at all because your character's immortal. What happens if he takes ten lethal? He falls unconscious because he's immortal. Well, yes. Why did this system have bashing and severe damage if your character can't die except under very specific circumstances so any amount of sufficient damage knocks them unconscious? The re- the answer? This game is fucking stupid. Well, the answer is mortals exist. Well, yeah, you need that so that you can track mortals as well, but it should have had a separate system for immortals. I mean, that is the core element of this book, is your character is an immortal being who can only be killed if his head is cut off, and then you have to learn this complicated bashing-slash-killing system well, that doesn't work. Well, come on now. There has to be separate heal times for both categories. That is true. There is separate heal times. Because you heal a point of severe like once a month or some crazy thing. If you're a human. If you're a human, yeah. yeah. If you're an immortal, you heal super fast. You heal like a point of casual damage every minute. Yeah. And then a point of severe every hour or something. It's crazy. Yeah. So that's so that's fine. It's just so dumb to me. It's like, this book consistently forgets its core premise. <laughs> the Okay, so the other thing to making a character is this has a merits and flaws system. Oh, yes, except that they're called accents and negative accents. Yeah, well, you have positive and negative accents. Yeah. And I'm going to go ahead and say this. Probably one of the better ways of hand- handling a uh, merit or flaw system, because none of them do anything mechanically. Like, you can have eidetic memory. You can have... I can calculate uh, math real quick in my head. I've got, like, a calculator brain. Or... I smell bad. What? I, or if... Yeah, for the negatives, you can have something like, I suffer from anxiety, or I've got a halitosis, or whatever the old ones that used to give you points that were real bad. Except now they don't do anything. There is no, like, oh, if you have anxiety, you're minus one on your modifier whenever you're fighting outside or See, whatever. my problem, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and disagree with this because the positive aspects don't do anything and the negative aspects don't do anything except for three of them, which are the positive aspects that make you psychic. Well, yeah. In order to actually use psychic powers, you have to get a I'm psychic ability and there's two levels of it. There's latent psychic, which means... You can only use your powers if you have a positive modifier to it. Right. So under ideal circumstances or you're pushed, sort of like your carry, who doesn't, like, really know how to control her power. It's just she gets stressed out and things explode around her. Yeah. Okay, so there are actually three levels. And they cost 20, 30, and 40 points. And you start with 30 points. So to be a full-fledged psychic, you need to have at least 10 points of negative accents just so you can spend all of your positive accent points on being the the, the actual psychic. The 20-point version is you could be psychic later. 
you buy it just so that you can buy the next two ranks with XP during the game with your with your DM's permission. The level 30 is the one John was just talking about. The one that costs 30 points is the one that John was just talking about, where you have psychic powers that can activate under certain circumstances. The 40 point one is you're psychic. You can buy the psychic powers and you can use them. Yeah, it's the difference between carry and fire starter. Yeah. So carry just kind of freaks out and uses it on accident, whereas the fire starter is just like, I set things on fire because I want to. Right. So that means that of these aspects, or accents, excuse me, you can pick the one that does something or any of the myriad ones that do not. And that's that's your option. So you can say, oh, my character has an eidetic memory. Does it do anything? No. Should I spend character points on it then? No. Not when there's character points in the exact same category that can be spent on something that does something. Well, yeah. The the fact that it's the only way to unlock psychic powers was real bad. Especially given that they're ripping off Highlander enough that the foreboding is a thing that literally every Highlander has. Yes. It doesn't matter. Any immortal running through the world... As soon as one gets near you, you have that moment where you look off into the distance and go, there's someone here. Someone has come. Yeah, that sort of thing. So I, I think this system is, if you took the psychic powers out of it, you'd be right. Except even then, I, I disagree. Because if it's a bunch of shit that doesn't do anything or affect the game in any way, why is it codified? Why not just say, hey, you should come up with some positive and negative traits to your character. Maybe he's got a super sharp memory. Maybe people don't like him because he has a nervous tick. Like, you don't have to go, ten points buys you a nervous tick. Like, for what? Oh. I know how to create character aspects. I could just say, fuck you, I took, I spent 30 points and took the good psychic one. Also, my character's got a pho- photographic memory. It's, it's exactly as effective as the one you spend points on, so fuck you. Huh. Huh. Prove I don't. Your character's like, you don't have a photographic memory because you didn't spend 30 points on it. Oh, okay. Didn't do anything anyway. So, I'm going to act like I do, and fuck you. Ah. So, I didn't like this system. If, if I'm going to take an accent system, I'm going to take the southern accents, the awesome Tom Petty album instead. <laughs> I'll spend 30 points on that. I'll spend 30 points on a Tom Petty album. I will, absolutely. It's, it, it'll do nothing, but whatever. All the other a- accents do nothing, too. <laughs> uh. So, I did not like it. Uh, you're right, it's it, it's nice that like you don't have to go... Uh, my character has one hand, so I get four extra points to spend on my character knowing a dirt on the Emperor. Yeah, it's... Well, it's there to encourage you to have something unique. Instead of just going like, what did you do? I have a guy in a trench coat, he has a sword. Oh, really? What, what is he like? Uh, he's like a lone wolf. He's kind of a Christopher Lambert type. <laughs> yeah. Instead of just making a character that is like, hey, I, I'm a guy with a sword, that's, that's me. It goes, yeah. alright, you have points to spend on things... Please spend it on making your character interesting. Yeah, I guess. The problem it, is that they gated psychic powers behind that. Right, which means that if you want to make your character psychic, which you should, because it's it's an extra power source that you're throwing away if you don't, then you, your character apparently doesn't have any positive or negative accents, except for being psychic. So your character is boring and efficient, or not boring and, and not efficient, except what's stopping you from just saying, oh, my character is also interesting? <laughs> like, what's stopping you from saying, I don't want ten extra accent points, but my character has shit breath? Like, what do you care? I spent, I didn't, I didn't get ten bonus points from it, but he's got shit breath. So, I don't know. It's like he ate a fucking fish frog. (laughs) It's gross. The the, the DM's not gonna be like, no, you didn't get ten bonus points for saying that, so it didn't happen. To me, it's more like it it hinders creativity. I understand where you're going for. Well, no, I I think it only hinders it if you look at it with the gating mechanic in there. If you take that out, then it goes. Look, you've got some points to spend, and. For the people who would go, oh, I made a fully fleshed out character without that, you're going to do that anyway. Right, that's what I think, The people who wouldn't, though, are going to look at that and go, oh, well, I have to spend these points. So it makes someone who is just the full munchkin, I'm only doing things if it gets me points, spend their points on something. They might look at, oh, eidetic memory. Okay, I can remember anything. That's going to come in handy at some point. I know it will. And then put that down on their sheet, and what do you know, now their character has a trait. You know, I take that power when I can, when I'm making characters, because I'm terrible at remembering names. Yeah, because you are terrible at names. Uh, No, yes, exactly. I am literally terrible with names in real life. I'm way better at remembering faces or details about people than I am remembering names. And I'm one of those people who gets names confused. Yeah. I call everyone I know everyone else's names. It's just a weird thing about me. So, in an attempt to not piss off my DMs who create complicated, detailed worlds and then give them a bunch of fantasy names that just flow right past my head. I just go, my character has the eidetic memory trait, so anytime I, the player, forget someone's name, my character didn't. It's cool. 
Yeah. It's cool. Just just that. <laughs> it's, it's cool. <laughs> just just go with it. Don't get mad at me for a weird quirk about me. Instead, my character remembers. <laughs> yeah. Look, I substituted my character's weird quirk for my weird quirk. Yeah. I used I used in-game tools to buy my way out of a personality defect. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, you're munchkinning your own personality in the system. <laughs> it works. It helps. I can be like, hey, what's that guy's name? Oh, don't you remember anything about my world? Uh no, but my character does, so, <laughs> he so does. move forward. Move forward. Uh, anyway anyway, uh, I didn't care for the accent system because like I said, I, I, but you're right. You're absolutely right that it forces players to who, who would otherwise not do so to be like, okay, my character's kinda Christopher Lamberty, unless we're playing a low budget game, and then he's kinda James Remarish. <laughs> He's Remar-esque, if you will. Uh, so, okay. In addition to that, uh, how we discussed how normal abilities work. So, you just roll under your stat plus ability. It's it's very normal. Uh, combat is a little different. So, what happens is you have the person with the highest agility goes first. Mm-hmm. If that's tied, then it goes to intellect. intellect. If that's tied, it goes to psyche. And if that's tied, you flip a coin. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why you don't start by rolling one of those ten-sided dice you have li- lying around. I don't know why maybe, they decided not to do that. Maybe but, add your agility if you still want to keep that involved, I guess. I mean, yeah. I, it's, it's not like there weren't some dice on the table. Nope. Apparently, they did not want to do that. Yeah. But that's that's your order. And then you have one action you can do. Uh, now, moving doesn't count as your action. Mm-hmm. So you've got a bunch of like free actions you can do. You can do a little bit of moving. You can talk to someone, whatever. That doesn't count as your action. Yeah, you can make a little mo- noise. You can do a little dance. You can make a little love. Yeah. You can get down tonight. <laughs> you can get down tonight. That's a free action in this game. <laughs> Getting down tonight. <laughs> also, uh, oddly enough, although it's a free action to get down tonight, it's a minor action if you want to get down on it. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Okay. So, you pick whatever you want to do, and whatever you're doing either has, uh, essentially it swings from, like, plus one to your attack to minus two. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the minus two is if you are trying to be... Uh, a riposte guy. So you're a counterattacker. Because mm-hmm. your attacks are, you can lunge, you can parry, you can thrust. Twirl, dodge, spin, strike! <laughs> parry, parry, thrust, thrust, good! <laughs> How appropriate, you fight like a cow! <laughs> <laughs> uh, so your options are all of these different things. So it's like, oh, if you lunge, you're minus one to the ta- attack, but you're Plus three to damage. Okay. If you just thrust, then you're plus one to the attack, but it does normal damage. Riposte is you parry and then attack. So parry is one of the options is I'm going to... Someone attacks me, I use my action for the turn to stop them from hitting me. Okay. Right, which means that it's easy if you have a high agility to just beat other people into never getting a turn to swing. Well... If you have the high agility and you're the first one to attack, it means, okay, I go after you. You either uh, dump your action for the turn into stopping me from killing you, or hope that I don't. Or, if you have a high enough uh, baseline agility plus swordsmanship or whatever, you can riposte and go, look, I'm going to have minus two to my thing, and I'm going to parry and stab you. Great. Right. So, ah. I don't know. It just seems clunky to me, and it seems like it's it, it's difficult to get anything done, and it really favors agility characters. Well, it really does, because all strength does is add to the damage, which, meh. Uh, it's got, much like the wound track in White Wolf, the more wounds you take, the more negatives you have to what you're doing. So the first person to hit, even if you don't kill the other guy, you're probably going to then just win. Because if I stab someone and I go, all right, you have ten health levels, I did five. Great. Now you're at minus two to do anything baseline, which means now it's way easier for me to kill you anyway. Right. So it's a spiral game, too. Yeah. And at least White Wolf had that, I spend a willpower and ignore it, whereas this does not. Right. Uh, Oh, well. the The other thing is, this game has one of my very favorite things in any game. 
Hit location. Woo! Hit location. Is it randomly rolled? Of course it is. Of course, because your character isn't a competent swordsman who can aim. No, if you want to try and aim, you can. But let's say I want to aim for the neck. That's a minus five penalty. <laughs> yeah. What is it with the, the hit locations and them always being randomly rolled? Your character is supposed to be competent. Well, the whole point with a lot of them is if I'm shooting at someone, it's supposed to be if I'm in cover and say my waist and below is covered, mm -hmm. then if you roll, that is a hit location. It's you hit my cover. Right. And it's the same thing here of, oh, I'm wearing a breastplate, which means if you rolled to shoot me, unless you rolled a four or five on the hit location, which is in the chest area, then great, you just shot my arm and my armor does nothing. I think my favorite part from the cover one in this one was that it had the, the degrees of cover that you can be behind, and one of them was like, if you're standing behind, like, on a curb, then they won't be able to hit your feet, because your feet are hidden by the curb. It's like, what? Who's swinging at your fucking feet? Oh, yeah. It's like, uh, it, yeah, they had like, if you have like eight inches of cover, then you get the following uh, bonus. Yeah, no, there's a bunch of things in there where it's like, oh, are, are you standing waist high at something? Is something only covering your arm? Is whatever happening? You're like, okay, great. Now, it does at least say in there, hey, don't use this if you don't want to. Yeah. Like, that's nice. Yeah. Thank you for doing that, because that's way better. I love hit location tables so much. They're one of my... <sighs> I'd say the only thing that's more clunky and irritating to run into is one of those detailed critical hit tables. <laughs> See, at least that's amusing to me. They're amusing once. The problem with the critical hit tables is that they never set them up in the correct way. The correct way is, monsters don't get this. Oh, yeah. Well, in the same way, in this game, a, you have karma points. That's your XP. You can spend those to raise up your abilities. You can raise up your stats. Uh, you can also spend them as, like, the karma points from other games. Yeah. So, uh, you would have, say, uh, I'm trying to shoot someone. I can spend karma points and get a bonus to the action equal to the number of points I spend. So I could spend four and get a plus four to the roll. Right. Okay, I think there's one last thing we really got to talk about before we get into our favorites and least favorite things in this book, because we haven't touched on it yet, and I would say it's probably one of the reasons that this book is so famous. <laughs> and and I think well, you know. No, I've, been, I've been waiting for this to come up. Yeah, so why don't we go ahead and talk about this book and its amazing art. Okay, this is a podcast. You can't see it, but oh my god. Yeah, so I'm sorry that this is not a visual medium, because I wish it was, so I could show you the art in this book, because... I mean, we've talked about art before. We talked about the art in Street Fighter. I mean, we talked about the the just photographs that were in Heaven and Earth. Yep. Including, like, that guy's girlfriend with her top off looking creeped out that he's taking pictures of her for his book. Huh? Huh? I mean, but this book is dumb schmucks dressed like they're in that 90s grunge apartment dating show uh, swingers. Or it is... singles, sorry. It is LARPers with the wind filter. Yeah, LARPers with the wind filter and sometimes their mom. Sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. And and a couple other filters here and there, too. One of them looks like one of the Red Letter Media guys. <laughs> I mean, I think, I, I forget his name. Uh, it's the, the, the weird one, the, the kind of dumpy one that they always make fun of on Red Letter Media. Yeah. Like, he's, and this, they gave him a mustache and a shotgun, and they were like, there, you're an immortal, you, you fat, balding gas station attendant. But all of them are just like, what is this? Oh, it's some dumpy guy standing next to, like... The like an uh, austerity the, grade apartment complex, or like the fence outside a high school. Yeah, it's <laughs> every picture looks like it was taken after they hopped out of a beat up Trans Am. Oh yeah, this, like an IROC covered in Bondo, and everyone is just, "What are you? Oh, I'm wearing a trench coat." And like, there's one guy who has a Ramones t shirt that they couldn't filter out. Yeah, you could just tell it's a Ramones t shirt. Yeah, every one of them, trench coat or Ramones t shirt or leather jacket, ponytail. <laughs> or Jonathan Taylor Thomas hair, which I don't even know a better way to describe that. That 90s haircut that gives you front wings if you're a guy, oh, yeah. that's that's Jonathan Taylor Thomas hair. This book came out in 1993, and that was all of the rage. Yeah. Every single rage. I tried to do that. I have a curly-ass afro. I'm, I'm the, the Jewiest I know. You have a curly-ass afro. And that also. I mean, I keep my head shaved these days, but the butt, it flows free. It's comfortable. It's, it's so good for the sit. Yeah, but anyway, I have big curly screech hair, so when I tried to do that 93, uh, let's give myself the, the the front wings, it turned into full wings, I looked like a, I had a seagull parked on my head. 
Like, I mean, you could, you could run your hands along the side of my head and not touch hair because it was out about four inches and coming down. I looked like a, I looked like a mushroom cloud. But no. Everyone knows what Jonathan Taylor Thomas hair is. I think we, we, we've established that. It's also the haircut that uh, certain artists can only draw for, for uh, X-Men. Yes. Every X-Men hair. Like, they give Gambit that dumbass hair for a couple of times. Uh, Gambit doesn't have that. But anyway, um, everyone's got that, or they've got a ponytail, or they're bald, which is hilarious. Uh, and then they're all wearing sunglasses and carrying their own katana that they definitely own for sure. One of the things I was amazed about in this book is that the katana in the weapon section is not fucking amazing. It's just not actually sword. it is. is it, it's, well, it's better. It looks good, but then you realize it's two handed. Well, the thing is, it is the only weapon that does plus three damage. Mm-hmm. That is also plus one to hit. Oh, that that's true. Yeah, so it is the best weapon. It is the best weapon because the other one is you could get up to a two handed weapon that is plus four damage. But then it's minus one to hit. So why don't we talk briefly what what our favorite piece of art in here and then describe it? Because I have one I'm ready. To, I'm, I'm pretty up. sure it's the same one uh, for both of us. Okay, I don't know because my uh, in the, I, it's I really the like psychic powers one. Oh god, that is a really good one with the guy smiling. And okay, the, yeah. So yeah, you my, go ahead. <laughs> my favorite is let me paint you a picture here under psychic powers when they're talking about I think it's clairvoyance. Yeah. Uh, there's a picture of a guy who is just sort of looks vaguely Jeffish because he's got a weird fro. And he's just a big, smiley white dude. And then they did, like, it looks like the background behind him is a disco ball. Yeah. And then they did weird effects on it to ripple it out. But he's just standing there with the goofiest smile on his face, like, I can see into the future. And not only that, but they also put his head behind, they, they, they took three copies of his head and blew them up. So he's just sitting on, like the, the front version is just sitting on larger versions of his head behind him. Oh yeah, it looks like he's turning into a giant headed Hulk. And you could tell that Photoshop wasn't really on its full game in 1993 because <laughs> they couldn't get a good, uh, drag to cut him out and make him clear. Cause there's just big obvious squares surrounding his head where they had to cut out, cut him out from the background. Oh, it's so good. Oh, it's amazing. That, that picture is, it is life. It is love. Yeah. My favorite is the one where there's some dude jumping off of like a three foot, like, stoop to hit his friend with a sword. And, <laughs> and, and uh, it looks, it, I mean, it's supposed to look like he's badass and descending from above, but it looks like he's jumping off one of those like efficiency apartment buildings that Sesame Street has to try and hit his friend who's just standing near Oscar the Grouch's trash can. And they applied so much wind filter, so you couldn't see that this guy is just a dumpy moron jumping off of a step, that they, when they finished with the wind filter, they realized that they had accidentally winded his sword out of existence, and so they took the line tool and just put a line where his sword blade should be. Oh, yeah. They just sort of... I, I drew his sword in, it looks like? Yeah. It, it looks like pixels. It looks like they were just like, and a line of two pixel depth right there because we accidentally winded his sword That's out of existence. That's what a sword looks That's like. That's good enough. It's a line on the end of a stick. It looks like a lightsaber filtered through Tron. Ugh. Okay. That is... That is the art in this book. And it just goes on like that. Like Amazing. The, the picture for, uh, for the, in the How to Deal with Trouble Players section of the book is clearly just one of their aunts or moms or something, and they applied a little bit of a pixelation filter, and she's just looking up from something she's reading. Like, she's she's sitting there with Reader's Digest large print edition, and she just looks up and goes, What's that, dear? Oh, for, that's nice, honey. For a game? Okay. <laughs> oh, oh, all right. You boys have fun. And there's one that's just of, like, a confused stranger in the distance. Like, it looks like they just were like, oh, there's someone coming up from that stairwell. That's super gothy. Take a picture of it. And it's just like some house mom looking person just coming around to a corner. But they've tried to apply enough blur filters to make it confusing. Yeah. Oh, my God. The art is, is magic. Anyway, what would you say is your favorite thing about this game, John? Uh, okay. Best thing in Legacy, War of Ages. <sighs> Uh, you want to say you were, we we had a discussion before I had we I had, okay so my thing is I was reading this and it wasn't bad until I hit the combat section yeah while the prose is definitely up its own ass holy a lot, god is it ever I mean that's gonna come up in my least favorite thing but like the the player advice thing for like oh how to deal with problem players isn't bad because so often this comes up in books and it's like. Oh, well, you gotta teach them a lesson. Maybe have their character choke on dick or whatever. I don't care. Fucking show them who's boss. Yeah, a lot of the time it gets adversarial. Well, this is pretty like, hey, have a conversation with them. Yeah, this book is, hey man, if someone's being a problem, 
Tell them about it. Maybe they don't even realize that they're being a problem. Show them in the book where where you decided to start talking to them under the section that labels them as the fool. <laughs> They'll love that. Well, it even says in there, we don't mean fool as in you are foolish, but as in the tarot meaning of the fool of someone that doesn't realize they're putting themselves in danger. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure that that'll go over real well when you show them that, though. Except you aren't. You aren't going to take the book and go, let me read this to you. By the way, I'm sure you didn't read this book that we're all playing, so when I call you the section that's clearly from The Fool, don't think I'm calling you that. You might think I'm calling you the section that's labeled The Fucking Moron. (laughs) Except you're not going to go up and go, hey, look, man, you're being a real The Monster right now. The Monster. You're being a a real Frankenstein's dad right now. Frankenstein's dad is what that section should have been called. But it's not The Monster, it's the monstrosity. Yeah. And which is basically a combat you have someone monkey. who's being a combat monkey and yeah. no one else is. Yeah. Oh my god. Call them the monstrosity. They'll love that. But again, it doesn't tell you to do that. No, I know. The book says, look, just talk to them and tell them they're being an asshole and try to work it out. I'm being meaner to this section than you are. I'm glad it's your favorite because it's an interesting section. It's no. good it's mostly good advice. Yeah, because it's a section that exists in a lot of books, but it doesn't boil down to use your power as the GM to be a huge dickbag. Yeah, I'm just having trouble wiping off the layers of their own butt that they had to crawl, <laughs> had to paint. Uh, fucking tarot cards. And it's not just named after tarot cards, but then after every tarot card is a quote from something I couldn't give two shits about. Well, Maybe that's like, because, as we said before, literally everything. It doesn't matter. It's not just like the beginning of chapters or the beginning of a, a header. It's every single thing they talk about has a quote. No, seriously, the section, in that section, the character who's playing the pest... You have to go, okay, the pest. What's the pest? Let's see. Oh, well, well it's I, John I, Leguizamo. No, you wish it was John Leguizamo, but you read through, you're like, what's the pest? Oh, well, first of all, I'm sure I'll glean what a pest is from this quote from a Billy Joel song. <laughs> oh, it's true. Yeah, it's my life. That's the song that they quote there, just for fun. I, I, I Thank you for putting a Billy Joel quote here. That was a useful use of page space. Yeah, the, the quotes thing, terrible. Oh, okay, whatever. You know what? Fine. That was my favorite thing. What was your favorite thing in Legacy, War of Ages? Oh, God. Uh, okay, my favorite thing in Legacy, War of Ages is that they combined strength and agility for a, sc- for a skill set package. I thought that was smart because normally you always run out of shit to put in strength. And it's always like, what are you good at because you're in strength? Jumping. Climbing. Swimming. Done. <laughs> Being strong. Lifting. It's, it's always a bad choice except that you need it because it's the damage table. By realizing that there's never enough strength ones to combine and just putting it in with agility, that was a good idea. So, okay. there you go. I thought that was all right. That's the best advice, uh, nice thing I can say about this book. I hated way more than you, apparently. Oh, you did. You hated this way more than I did. Yeah, okay. Your least favorite thing. Okay, least favorite thing in this book. Uh, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and say that the worst thing in this book was uh, in the combat section... Which, again, I was reading this and I was basically fine. They were up their own ass. But at least it was okay. You get to the combat section and it's a little clunky. But you get to things like falling damage or getting hit by a car. And it needs you to calculate what the damage is based on meters per second. Yeah, there's a big section on meters per second in this D10 super abstracted game. And by the time you hit that, I'm like, you have been talking about how you wanted a game that was stripped down and wasn't all about the mechanics and the dice and we really wanted to get into the role playing of whatever and they're like all right now if you're hit by a car we need to figure out the meters per second so we can find the velocity of whatever and you're like no fucking no don't do it let's talk about terminal velocity in relation to falling damage no don't don't fucking do that your character is immortal did the car hit his head off then it was <laughs> then it's then he's unconscious yeah it was uh, that section pissed me off so much because even the combat section was bad but then getting to that I'm like no no fuck you book no yeah that was that's so annoying that's like GURPS rules yeah I'm like don't don't do that to your setting that you're I mean even if your setting is bad and ripped off at least stick to the theme that you've had so far which is very simplistic okay and, okay I'm sorry. no I'm there sorry you go. no you're right no, no, you're no. absolutely right all right uh least favorite thing for you it's the tone the tone of this book is the most up-its-own-butt book I've ever read. Like, it's true. It's, it's ridiculous. Every single time they have a chance to say something in a simple, concise way, they instead add thir- th- like half a page of just dumb prose about, about uh, the meanings of things. There's a section in the book for themes, how to write adventures. 
And it says, to write an adventure, you're going to need to pick some themes. Here are some common themes that are used for writing stories in this. Mediocrity versus excellence. Fate versus divination. Chance versus, versus permanence. Stability versus change. The individual versus society. Okay, great. Great, so I guess oh, my character rolls for Jungian archetype. I, I, what the fuck is this? Just, <laughs> just give me some lists of monsters and shit. Yeah, no, the... The duality of man versus the, the, the uh, platonic solid ideal. Yeah, no, the, that theme section was... Is, I, I don't understand who that's for. Because either you're someone who would read that and go like, oh, well, yes, obviously, that's what I'm doing. When I make a game, I try to make my players understand that the world is a place wherein the shadow exists alongside the darkness and murder. I can tell you exactly who that section's for. That section is for someone who has a friend who wants them to read a manu- or, or yeah, a screenplay. <laughs> and they're like, here, would you read my screenplay? And you're like, well, I don't know. Before that, could you read this section on themes from this ancient shitty book? Because I really want to make sure that you know that it's important for it to be about the, the battle between chaos and stability. That's yeah. what it is. To just get someone with a screenplay off your back. It, it's not useful for a game. No, the the whole thing is semi-useful, at least, if they didn't put it in its own section. Because the idea of, hey, if you're an immortal, play with the idea of, you've been around for hundreds of years. You've watched the people you grew up with die and pass on. You've watched, like... Cities crumble, you have watched societies rise and fall. The idea that to you, something might be precious, okay, that's actually a thing to play with. Yeah, That's sure. an interesting idea. However, that's more in a role-playing than a theme for your game. Fair, and I feel like you're willing to do a lot of unpacking for this book. To kind of read its its pretentious college grad student bullshit and be like, oh, okay, what they mean by that is do this. Oh, yeah. No, I, I'm reading this and I'm like, look, I, I have a degree in bullshit, which yeah. means I can read this and go, I understand what your bullshit is. Right. It's like To me, it's like it's like hearing you boil James Joyce down to like, <laughs> like an actual story that makes sense. Let like, me tell you about Finnegan's Wake. Like, here, this is what Finnegan's Wake is about. No, don't do him any favors. <laughs> You let that book stand on its own shitty merits. That's what this book needs to have happen. This book is pretentious as fuck. No, it's true. It really is. Yeah, and it needs to be lambasted for that. So that's that's where I'm coming from. That's yeah, my least favorite. It needs to be thing. Christopher lambasted yeah. for that. Also, one of my favorite things about the whole themes thing is that the whole point of this game is immortals are scared because they are falling behind in terms of technology. It used to be that it was very easy to, for them to just move to another town and be like. Uh, let's see, in the last town I was John Jackson. Hello everyone, I'm Jack Johnson. I'm in my rugged early 30s, and I will be for the next 20 years, and then I'll move to another town before anyone gets suspicious. But here in the modern era, it's becoming increasingly likely that your character may end up at a computer database and have a hard time being tracked. It's like, okay, this book was written in 1993. It was all, the DMV already existed in 1993, and they were setting their game in 2105. I mean, who they're like, oh, the immortals are slightly scared that some that someone may find a way to track them. In 2105, when the internet exists and it's got all virtual reality and shit, they are tracking you. You have a barcode in your fucking neck. It's, use the stuff you wrote. I know you, or stole, I know you really liked William Gibson. Use the shit William Gibson wrote. He wrote it in the early 80s. Except it doesn't work with Highlander. No, it sure that's, doesn't. That's the problem of they loved both of these things, and they put them both in the same area. Why? And the ideas behind both of them don't work. That's no. the that's the main issue, is Immortals are its own package of ideas, and the whole cyber weird future of, like, blending man and machine is another interesting theme, but the two of them don't mesh. Well, it, just, it specifically grumps me up, because the Neuromancer trilogy is one of the coolest settings ever. It's it's all written in the early 80s, and it's kind of a predictive thing about what the 2000s would have been like. And he got some really interesting stuff right, and some really interesting stuff crazily wrong, but it was very interesting predictive fiction, and I've always wanted a good RPG set in the Neuromancer era. Where you've got girls who can fire razor blades out of their fingers, and have permanent grafted on sunglasses, <laughs> and you've got, like, the sky is the color of, of a static of a static television, all this other amazing stuff, uh, except that the first time I've ever found it and enc- encountered it's with its serial numbers filed off in this piece of shit. Yeah, I'm so go. angry. Well, there, there you have it. Would you I don't this care game? about Neuromancer, so I don't care. Well, you, you also don't care about Highlander, so, there, so this one doesn't hit you at all. I don't care about Highlander, but 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 uh, Neuromancer is one of my favorites. Yeah. Uh, okay. Would you play this game? Uh 
I mean, I could see myself back in high school. If someone had come up to me and was like, hey man, instead of running, you know, Rifts or D&D or whatever, we're going to have a game of Legacy. I'd go, all right, cool. I'll make a dude with a sword and a trench coat. I'm 16 years old, and that sounds fucking rad to me. <laughs> like, I'm not I'm not going to lie to you folks. I owned a trench coat, okay? I'm going to come right out and just, I'm going to bear my heart to you. Mm-hmm. I owned a trench coat in high school. I did, was and it, I'm sorry. Was it leather? No. Was it one like, like just like a suit jacket, but the, but it was way too long? Uh, no, it was a, it was just a regular trench coat. Oh, because I had I had basically a suit jacket, except that the hem ended at my ankles. Wow. I don't know where. I think I got it at a used clothing store, and I think it was like an old Russian coat. And I, I bought it because I was like, oh shit, look at this thing. And then I lived in San Diego my whole life. It, I never used it for anything. Oh yeah, well there there was at least one guy that walked around in something like that, where it was just like, what is this? Oh, it's like a, a heavy Russian, like, military coat. Yeah. Okay, you realize you're in Southern California, and it's like 85 degrees out. Oh, I don't care, I'm wearing it anyway. So, I also owned a trench coat in high school, but I think I might be able to out-nerd you here, because I can tell you the grim fate of my trench coat. Oh, I can tell you the grim fate of my trench coat. It's sitting in a closet right now. Nice. Mine? Here's the story. Uh, I decided to destroy it, so I cut the sleeves off it and made a cipher costume. Nice! That's correct. I went as a bad guy from Final Fantasy VIII for Halloween one year, and I forced my little brother to dress up as Zell. (laughs) Oh, way to be. Right? Yeah. No, so I I, I took my... my, Because it just happened to be a gray trench coat and turned it into a safer costume. Good job. I'm glad. Yeah, I, I was a huge dorky nerd. That's true. Yep, so there you go. We both had trench coats. We're trench coat buddies. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, America. <laughs> but even then, to answer the question... Not Britain, though. I'm not sorry to you. Oh my God. You limey fucks. Well, they still wear trench coats all the time. It's a big thing over there. Yeah, how dare you? How dare you? It's cold, and, and well, you know what? No way. Why am I defending the British? Don't defend the British. They don't deserve it. I stand in solidarity with Paris <laughs> against the Brits. Yeah. I stand in solidarity in the War of the Roses. <laughs> Uh, get, rid of, get rid of the channel. <laughs> okay, uh, no. And, and to answer the question, would I play this game? No. Even though I owned a trench coat in high school, I was not the kind of kid who wore the trench coat. I just had it for some reason. Uh, so I was not the kind of, that particular type of, oh, I would totally play as a Highlander nerd. Uh, and, and so for me, even as a high school kid, I would not have played this game. This game would have pissed me off back then, too. Okay. So no, never. I would never play this game. <laughs> There does exist a universe where I would play this game, though. Okay. So, there you go. There's my answer. <laughs> there exists a universe. Given the the multiverse theory, there is a point where I would play this. In such strange worlds, even death may die. <laughs> even John may play Legacy War of Ages. <laughs> oh, well, there you have it, folks. That is Legacy War of Ages. Whoa. All right, so uh, as always, if you want to recommend a role-playing game or send us a role-playing game to review, you can do that. Just... Uh, Drop us a line at systemmasterypodcast.com. You can do that in the comment feeds, or you can hit us up on System Mastery on Facebook, Twitter, or Gmail. Yep. John's phone number, in case you want to just call him directly. <laughs> you know what? Actually, that'd be a little complicated. John's phone is is uh, not charged right now. So John's parents' home number, so that they can get a hold of John to tell him the role-playing games you recommend. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, Facebook, Gmail, Twitter, at System Mastery. We're very easy to find. Uh, support us on Patreon. If you do that, then you get our bonus content, and that's when we make we go and make characters in these games. Yeah, just wait until you find out what immortals we make this week. I'm so excited. Uh, so we're gonna, that's that's our Patreon. You can support us. Any amount you give us gets you the bonus content. It doesn't matter what, but there are other tiers you can look at, so support that. Patreon slash System Mastery. Go for it. Uh, tune in next week. We'll be doing our Afterthought podcast, which is the discussion podcast. For Afterthought, it has really just turned into a big old send us the stupidest questions you can think of and we answer them. We're embracing that. It's fun. It's, it's the most it is the most fun I have basically every week. Yeah. Is, so, is the afterthought. So, so send us your dumbest questions and we will answer them on Afterthought. And then of course we need movie recommendations for the Movie Mastery Podcast, because we're busy podcasters. Yeah, we are podcasting everywhere. But just every day, podcasts. <laughs> so uh as always, this has been System Mastery. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you continue to listen and have a lovely week.